All right, I'm going to have to make a response to Eclectic Media in video format because it's just going to be easier for me at this point to make all my points in this format rather than text. For one, you make you have a certain way of quoting things that just does not reflect what I say. And you respond in a way that I do not like. So I'm going to respond in this way. And I'm going to force you to actually respond to my actual points instead of having you chip chop little bits out of it and then completely respond to things I haven't been saying. So this is what we've been going through for the past month. I just want you to get the idea of just how busy we've two been. Right. Okay, here's okay, here's the final one. I don't care about your standard. You're gonna block me, just go ahead and do it. Because I don't think you're gonna not block me anyways. Not because I'm being dishonest, but because you are. And that you don't like being called dishonest? Well, too bad. You are. Now, I'm not going to make this public. I'm not going to make this video public unless you specifically request it. But if you get so as so bad as to necessitate it, I will make this public. So, you seem to think that saying, explaining a quote mine twice is somehow negating the fact that you quote mine. It doesn't work. I'm sorry, I've already explained numerous times what exactly I meant. So let's go back to the quote in question, which I'm saying you're quote mining, and then we're going to go through it blow by blow. Okay, this is the, the thing I'm saying you're quote mining and question okay so see that as as I said you are an atheist so I'm not saying that you believe and I, it, I think that since you being an atheist I think it would also imply that you're not making an argument for God and that you're using an argument that you don't even believe works you've also neglected to, to address this what I've said at all but this is what you quote this simple little stuff to, to do what it seeks to prove and you said this is false I don't seek to prove God exists if you read the quote in whole to do what it seeks to prove is a failure on the ontological argument not your intent it is a failure on the ontological argument to do what it seeks to prove. And I'm saying you're using an argument like that. And yet, inconsistently, you are taking mostly the majority of its premises and saying what it says, essentially, but except the one last thing that God exists. So you either don't understand how the ontological argument works, or you just don't understand how you can be inconsistent with your atheism. Now you want to say that now I have to go through this whole thing of quoting you over and over again. I need to automize the, the points that you accept. Okay. That's itemized points you accept. So let's go back into where I state or I deliver the points that make your in position in consistent, basically. And that what commits you to the ontological argument. So let's itemize it, and then we'll find your statement that, that best matches those properties. Okay. Okay, 
here it is. It's not what I think the argument seeks to prove. Okay, consistently. One, maximum grade is still isn't universal. Okay. So the first thing is God is God is defined is maximally great. And the second itemized point is necessary existence is entailed by that greatness. And that a maximally great being and necessary existence are logically consistent properties. Okay. Once you do all those three, you are logically committed to the ontological argument. And I've already explained this. So, where do you do this? You do this, well, in your first reply to me, for one thing. You say, God, the con it is absolutely necessary for God to possess the concept of necessary existence and that he is maximally great or has maximal greatness. See, it's absolutely essential for the concept of God. Because it would not be a God if it didn't possess, correct? Yes, you agree. Let's go to the point again. I'll show you another place where you make that. And it's a move to Kenny. There we go. Maximal greatness is required for a God. To have the property of necessary existence. Okay. So that's points two and one. And here you go again. Consentency not only means that it's not the one true God. So again, you're saying that a God is not a God unless he specifically possesses the property of necessary existence. Again, so according to you, when I asked you that question, that yes or no question, does a, can, can there be such a thing as a contingent God? Is there a possibility that a God can exist and also be contingent? You dodged that completely. So, I've itemized that, so your claim is without merit, and I've showed it, and you say you recognize the other uh, concepts of God. Just saying that other people have recognized other concepts as a matter of history is not enough. As I've already shown, you've already made the distinctions between true gods and false gods and that is what I'm talking about if you're making distinctions between true gods and false gods then you're not acknowledging other conceptions of God you are denying that they are gods because you say they are false gods it is a mere logical deduction from what you are saying so you either have to backpedal or be dishonest because it is in the proof is in in this pudding so you can you can you can sit there and try to call me dishonest but nope it's you not like that all you want and threaten to block me go ahead all you do is bury yourself here so uh yep so you begging for quotes I've already given you that again. And uh do you have a direct quote of me saying God is defined as maximally great? Well, if a there is a true God and a false God, yes, we just went through that. And then I wonder why you even make these throwaway quotes. Uh, you quote a little piece here and you say, why, why don't you do this? When I actually go on to do this, just that very thing. So, because of you making that throwaway quote, I guess I have to respond to it. Okay. 
because of course you you can't you can't do that okay so again in the statement in whole property dualists is that the mental phenomenon are non-physical properties of the physical phenomenon but not properties of physical substances your ignorance of this is astounding just because you are not talking about something in a physical way or reducing to physical properties or phenomenon does not commit you to something that is beyond the physical now okay so then look I go further on so that's the original quote we go going over again and here we go the failure to understand not properties of physical substances you're not understanding that can only be your dishonesty yet again. And you seem to think that being able to overreact like you're confident and like that you know the point that you you are making and that would actually uh, make the point for you. It doesn't work that way. Sorry. So, again, you have failed to show that I've committed to anything physical. Okay? Again, if I think that a mental property is something, right? I'm thinking a mental property is something of the physical. You know, minds are what brains do. It is a process that emerges from physical phenomenon. So physical phenomenon don't have aboutness, but mental phenomenon do. But those mental phenomenon arise from physical processes and interactions. If it arises from physical processes and interactions, again, I fail to see how I am committed to anything other than the physical. Yet again, I demonstrate that you don't know property dualism. You don't know it. If I do not think that there isn't anything other than the physical, and the mind is an emergent process. That's the type of property dualist I am. I am an emergentist. I think things emerge from interactions and become more than the parts become more, or the, the whole process becomes more than its collection of parts. And that's how this phenomenon of talking aboutness and things, what it's like to think about certain ideas arises and yet cannot be reduced to specific physical properties just like a property dualist would because a property dualist wouldn't reduce physical properties to physical things because it's a non-reductive approach so I've just demonstrated in spades that you don't understand it at all So there you go. You can um, face palm all you want and make bare assertions as you state it all you want and make claims that I'm dishonest all you want and demonstrate that I'm not making, that I am actually somehow ontologically committed to something other than the physical. Okay, let's, let's look at uh, uh, Wikipedia here. What is a mental property? According to Wikipedia, a mental property, or a mind property, is a property of the, a, the mind, mostly used in the terms of philosophy of mind, without prejudice to its ontological status of mental properties. So, admitting to mental properties and physical substances, as a property dualist would, is not committing to anything other than the physical. And you ought to know that since you're a property dualist. You ought to know that. But you pretend you don't and you want to make what I'm saying what I'm not saying. So maybe now you should admit to being dishonest and just end it right here. Okay. And again, you're saying, when did I actually say God actually possesses this property? Okay. I'll ask my question again. 
Can there be a contingent God? Mm-hmm. Say, can there be a contingent God? Is that a contradiction of terms? Is a God that does not have maximal greatness a false God? As you put it. Okay. Okay, is is there a one true definition of God or is there a false God according to you? I don't think you can be dishonest about this. You either have to backpedal or you're going to turn around and say, no, that that's not what I'm really saying. And you want to say that God exists as... Now I have to quote you that God actually possesses this property. Even though that you say maximal greatness and necessary existence go in hand in hand and you make distinctions between true and false gods. Yeah, I don't need to actually do that. You've already just did. And as I said, what necessary existence is, is a reductio ad absurdum argument for its non-existence. So if something exists necessarily, or has the property of necessary existence, it cannot not exist. It has to exist. That's the, that's, that's the point of the ontological argument, is to make this very point. It has to exist. So you'll either have to back up on on maximal greatness and uh, necessary existence and in doing so reveal your hypocrisy and the con inconsistency of your argument as I've been stating the entire time or keep going with it and do exactly the same thing again except you know have your cake and eat it too you wanna have you know people say you know God possesses this property uh, necessarily for their own deity in order for you to recognize that God, but you don't believe that God exists, that is, that is like, and you don't believe that property is logically consistent. That is the, like, as I said before, the ultimate having your cake and eating it too. And it's, it really has to do with your whole arrogance and like this. Like you said, I shouldn't have to educate you in theology like this. You're not educating me in theology because this isn't theology. You're doing specifically Christianity and Abrahamic theology. This is not theology in general. This is not theology that represents the broadest concepts of what a God is or could be. And that's the dishonest part. That is the inconsistent part. Whether you understand this or not is irrelevant. You can thump your chest on all you want, make all your bare assertions all you want. There is nobody except the Christians like Saint Anselm saying that God must be like this. And I guarantee anybody who says that the only proper definition of a God is this maximally great God would it inevitably be of the Abrahamic persuasion? Like I said, you bought the Kool-Aid, sir. It's over. So you can either fess up and be honest or be dishonest. It's all up to you.